So someone on my Patreon account asked me a question that I'm surprised I've never really considered. He asked me whether or not I believe Cenk Uger's story about the circumstances of his departure from MSNBC. For those of you who don't remember, or weren't old enough to be politically aware at the time, Cenk had his audience lobby MSNBC to get him on the network. After being a contributor and filling in for Dylan Radigan occasionally, he was regularly hosting MSNBC Live during the 6pm time slot. Until one day, he stopped. A few weeks later, Cenk revealed that he was no longer working there, and gave his audience his version of the inside story. I am out at MSNBC. Now, whose decision was this? Well, it was both of our decisions. I will explain. Okay. I got pulled in, and they told me, hey, listen, uh, we were just, or it was actually one specific person, the head of MSNBC. He said, I was just in Washington, and people in Washington tell me that they're concerned about your tone. I was like, whoa, what? You know, despite all the things that I've said about the mainstream media, I still view that as kind of like theoretical. Like a real person, are they really going to say that? I was like, and I, I'm naively thinking, what does he mean? Did he just talk to his friend Bob in Washington? <laughs> but why would you say people in Washington if you meant, oh, yeah, I was talking to my buddy down at the shop about you. It just happened to be that he was a person in Washington. And you wouldn't frame it that way, right? But I'm still thinking that. And then he gives me the second part of the speech. Hey, listen, Jenk. Outsiders are cool. And they wear, I think he might have said something like, they wear leather jackets, they ride bikes. I think I'm an outsider, I don't ride a bike. But <laughs> I have a terrible leather jacket. Anyway, he said, I'd love to be an outsider, outsiders are cool. But we're not, we're insiders. We are the establishment. And I just kind of sat back. I was like, wow, this is it. This is the speech. So, he, he said, look, you got to tone it down. Uh, the problem with the mainstream media is they're desperate to get access. They don't challenge the government. They don't challenge power. And now you see that that is in fact true. When they give you the speech, you're not sure that it's true. When they act upon the speech, then you're sure it's true. Cenk was just keeping it too real, and the establishment couldn't handle it. So they offered him a generous contract to hide him away on the weekends. So do I believe that this is the way things went down? Well, first of all, I should say that Phil Griffin, who was the head of MSNBC at the time, and the guy who supposedly had this conversation with Jank, disputes Jank's account. According to the New York Times, Mr. Griffin denied Mr. Uger's accusations and sounded disappointed that he had decided not to accept the weekend position. We never told Jank what to say or what not to say, Mr. Griffin said. The people in Washington, he said, were MSNBC producers who were responsible for booking guests for the 6 p.m. hour. And some of them had said that Mr. Uger's aggressive body language and overall demeanor were making it harder to book guests. The conversation was, hey, look, here's how we can make it better, about the physical things on the show, Mr. Griffin said. We wanted Jank to stay at MSNBC, Griffin told The Hollywood Reporter. I think Jank fits our sensibility. We were working on a new contract that was going to have him on the weekends. Honestly, I was surprised that he chose not to take the deal, and that's the last we talked. And I was disappointed that he didn't stay, and hopefully we'll work it out someday and he'll come back. It doesn't appear as though anyone in the government in Washington was really worried about Jank either. Dan Pfeiffer, the White House communications director, said in an email Wednesday that his staff did not raise concerns with Phil Griffin or anyone else. I didn't agree with everything said on the show, but certainly didn't have any problem with it, Mr. Pfeiffer added. For what it's worth, Keith Overman, who also worked at MSNBC at one point in time and was controversial, but also much better known, said that MSNBC never instructed him on what or what not to say. Furthermore, the guy who ended up taking that weekend show was Chris Hayes. He left that weekend show after a year and a half to host a primetime slot on the same network. So, at least in his case, a weekend show wasn't some effort to hide him away. So, to recap, this is what we know. Jank said that Phil Griffin wanted him to change his tone or leave because people in Washington didn't like that he was critical of the Obama administration. Phil Griffin denies that and said that he wanted to work with Jank, and Dan Pfeiffer said that he never instructed Griffin to do anything. So, who do I believe? Well, to be honest, I don't know a whole lot about Dan Pfeiffer or Phil Griffin, so I don't know whether or not they can be trusted. But I do know Jank like a book, 
And there are very good reasons to believe that he, at the very least, misunderstood the conversation with Griffin, or is deliberately lying about it. One thing that you need to know about Jank is that he absolutely loves to characterize his opponents and detractors in the most comical, over-the-top ways. And so, uh, to your point, Jank, there are three states uh, that the Trump campaign are now targeting in order to overturn the results. Um, clearly, Michigan is one of them, that's what we're talking about right now. Uh, but they're also focusing specifically on um, Milwaukee, okay, so in Wisconsin, and they're uh, focusing on Atlanta in Georgia. Huh. Uh, all heavily black democratic cities. And so they wanna disenfranchise black voters. Uh, look, we're not that far from them saying, why don't we just bring back slavery? I mean, as long as we're breaking the law and we don't care about the constitution and we're burning our democracy to the ground and we're saying no black people should be uh, have their votes count. I mean, well, why don't we just go all the way with it? Conservatives, establishment Democrats, media figures, or really anyone who disagrees with Cenk are portrayed as absurd comic book villains on TYT. It's something that I've made an effort to point out on this channel because it's something that Cenk's audience just takes for granted. Cenk doesn't just mischaracterize his opponents though. Sometimes he just straight up puts words in their mouth and pretends that they take positions that they've never actually stated. Sometimes his own co-hosts will even call him on it. Well, I mean, I think you've made about nine jumps too many, but I'm not going to argue with the premise. I mean, I don't that first of all, mainstream media doesn't say that Exxon, they're do-gooders and they only want good things or, or those things. He loves to hide behind vagaries like the mainstream media, establishment politicians, and corporate donors so that he can just straw men his opponents without being called on it because he doesn't provide specifics. You, you've heard me say it a thousand times on the show, I guess I'm trying to compensate for the rest of media refusing to say that the emperor has no clothes. No, they're these people. It, Cenk. No, they're not. They are, are you kidding me? They're saying he's a lunatic. Donald Trump is a deranged lunatic. I mean, they don't call him a lunatic. lunatic. So now, have the Democrats and the corporate media explained to people that the majority of Republican voters don't believe in the Constitution? That they believe in an un American coup to steal an election? No, 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 beloved Republican voters, oh, Republican voters, we cannot offend you. We'll do political correctness, even though all the polls indicate you guys are all nuts and only 3% of you believe Joe Biden won the election. That political Jake, correctness the media? is destroying this country. I want you to be specific though, who in the media? Who in the media is justifying or in any way apologizing for the nonsense coming from Donald Trump in legitimate media? I'm not talking about gateway pundit or no, all, all no, these no, other no, lunatic no, outlets. No, 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 There's two, those are two different things. I'm not saying that the media is coming out saying Trump is right or let's uh, debate whether this election was won by Biden or Trump. I'm saying that they're not calling out the Republican politicians and the Republican they are, voters. Though. Republican voters, show me. We got to. We do a whole show. We got a staff. Find me one pundit on television anywhere saying that Republican sure. voters are nuts. That that They're an not overwhelming tell majority of them nuts. believe things that aren't remotely true. Okay. So I will I will show you that content later off air because it exists. They're not going to call voters lunatics. Uh, I don't think that that accomplishes anything. But they certainly they do call out Republican lawmakers, Republican lawmakers who are refusing to speak up and acknowledge the reality of the outcome of the election. They put pressure on those politicians on a regular basis, and I know that because I have to consume all this media all day long in order to prepare for this show. But I just. I, Anyway, I too consume a ton of media and more or less every mainstream outlet I've read is saying exactly that. So as far as I'm concerned, Anna is right. When Jenk said Phil Griffin told him we are the establishment and that outsiders wear leather jackets, I immediately became skeptical because real people don't talk that way. But it is exactly how the absurd, over-the-top cartoon character straw men that live in Jenk's imagination talk. This bubble is not from insulation though. There are people in his orbit who are willing to tell him when he's wrong. For example, despite covering politics for over two decades, it wasn't until he actually ran for office himself that he realized how much name recognition mattered in getting elected. When he figured this out, he was absolutely convinced that he was the first person to discover it, despite Anna telling him multiple times that this is very well known in political science literature. Look, my election taught me a lot of things. Uh, most important lesson, and Anna, it, you know, when we talked about it in one of the post games, you said, hey, Jake, that's obvious. That's what we learned in, in Politics 101, which is 
but I think you're totally wrong, okay? So let me explain, okay? okay? No one, no one on TV, none of the political strategists, none of the consultants knew the most simple fact about uh, politics, which is it's branding. Most of it is name recognition, the rest of it is mass media. There are depressing facts that rise from that, but go ahead. Okay, so you're just wrong. People do know that. I literally learned it in my political then my why did American everybody think that class Booker and Klobuchar. My graduate program. In other words, Jenk is extremely self-assured. If he didn't see people talking about something, then obviously nobody knew it. And his pushback means nothing, even though she's totally right about this. Jank allows his assumptions about the world to shape the information that he takes in, and he will readily dismiss anything that counters that. Here's an excellent example of Jank projecting his assumptions on a recent news story. On November 8th, 2020, Jank did a solo YouTube video on Trump's family trying to convince him to concede the election. This is what Jank said about Eric Trump's role in this. But my favorite out of all those guys is Eric. So <laughs> CNN story framed it as, they didn't say this, but you, it's between the lines, framed it as, Eric is like the one lone holdout who actually believes that, that they won. Like Don Jr. knows, they, Kushner obviously, Ivanka knows, they all know, right? <laughs> Eric's the true believer, because Eric's the dumbest one in the family. He's the one closest to dad. Um, that's why his dad can't stand him, he reminds him of him. Because they're, yeah, I, no, I probably Don Sr. is dumber than Eric, uh, to be fair. <laughs> but anyway, so Eric's like, and remember, the guy they're trying to get out of the barricades is, is Sr. So, yeah, as we're having a conversation about who's on the right side and wrong side of telling him he lost, the guy who doesn't know he lost is Trump, right? Although there's a caveat there too. So anyway, Eric's like, uh, I think uh, I think they stole this election, right? And everybody else in the family's like, and this is my traumatic reenactment, let's be honest, okay? But it's based on reporting from Siena. So Eric's like, we, we, we got him, right? They, they're trying to steal this election, we're gonna win, right? Picturing Beavis and Butthead, I forget which one he is, he's, Beavis, right? And so I got a lot of analogies for Don Jr. and Eric. Beavis, Butthead, Ude, Kuse. Anyway, so then Kuse comes by and he's like, Eric still thinks we won? <laughs> and Ivanka's like, yeah. Like, okay, just let him go. Just let him, let him have fun. Did you notice what he said there? That's what the article implies if you read between the lines. Now, those of you who watch this channel know that I don't like the president. And you probably could have guessed that I think very little of his idiot adult sons, Eric and Don Jr. So initially, the story seemed plausible. But because I don't trust Jank, I decided to go and read what the actual article says. The article is from CNN. Its title is Jared Kushner, Melania Trump, advised Trump to accept election loss. It was written just a few hours before Jank uploaded his video. The link for the article is in the description box below, but I'll recite all of the parts where it mentions Eric Trump, and you can decide for yourself if Jank's interpretation is honest. President Donald Trump's inner circle is beginning to split over his ongoing refusal to accept the results of the 2020 election, as Jared Kushner and First Lady Melania Trump advised him to come to terms with President-elect Joe Biden's victory. And his adult sons pressed him and his allies to keep fighting. Kushner, the president's son-in-law and senior advisor, has approached him to concede, two sources told CNN. The first lady, according to a separate source familiar with the conversations, has privately said that the time has come for him to accept the election loss. Meanwhile, Trump's two adult sons, Don Jr. and Eric, have urged allies to continue pressing on, and they have pushed Republicans and supporters to publicly reject the results even as CNN and other news organizations projected the race for Biden on Saturday. Trump's two adult sons have been key voices in urging the president and his allies to continue contesting the results of the 2020 election, according to multiple sources. Beyond public posturing on social media, both Don Jr. and Eric Trump have been digging in their heels, seeking to drum up broad GOP support for contesting the election results and telling allies they genuinely believe the election was fraudulent. In recent conversations, Eric Trump has told allies he believes the election was stolen from us according to a source familiar with his comments, and vowed to fight to overturn the results. And in the days since Don Jr. called out Republicans, and in particular 2024 GOP hopefuls, for not offering sufficient backing to the president's claims, the eldest son has been waging a lobbying effort among senators and governors to release supportive statements, according to people familiar with the conversations. So far, there has been only a moderate wave of outward support from Republicans. Though some, including House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy and House Republican Whip Steve Scalise, have said that the president's legal maneuvers must be resolved before the election can be called. And South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem, who is said to be considering a run in 2024, appeared Sunday on ABC to say that the president deserves his day in court. 
Many other Republicans are also growing frustrated with the pressure campaign and lack of evidence of voter fraud thus far presented by the Trump team, with some prominent Republicans urging the president's team to put up or shut up. But Trump's sons are not alone in encouraging the president to wage legal war rather than concede. Meadows is also said to be encouraging an arduous legal fight, as has Trump lawyer Rudy Giuliani, former Florida Attorney General Pam Bondi, and the president's longtime political advisors Corey Lewandowski and David Bosey. In the days following the election, Don Jr. traveled to Georgia, where two congressional races, one of which has already advanced to a January 5th runoff, and the other is likely to, could determine control of the Senate. While he was there, he held a press conference decrying the vote counting process in the state. People familiar with the matter said he also held meetings focused on the upcoming Senate races. The president has privately expressed frustration that some Republican leaders appear ready to move on from his race to focus on the Georgia election. People familiar with the conversation said, insisting they focus on him instead. So, unless I missed something, and again, the link to the article is in the description below, I have no idea where Jenk read between the lines to come up with his conclusion. He admitted that he took some artistic license with his reenactment, but he did say that his speculation was confirmed by CNN. Nowhere in that article, at least not that I saw, is it implied that Eric was the butt of a joke. His position seems to be in line with most Republicans at this point. Jenk's interpretation wasn't a one-off either. Either. That video we just watched was recorded on a Sunday night. The very next day, on the Monday TYT main show, Jenk said this. So there was a story that came out over the weekend, like different people thinking about how they're gonna talk to Trump and get him out of the bunker and tell him, no, really, you lost. And everybody gets it, but they all have different political strategies. Don Jr.'s thinking of running for something, and so he's angling like, oh no, dad, I'm with you, even though he knows it's that. The only one in the White House who doesn't get it is Eric. Because he's just, he's like, he's Beavis. So he's like, yeah, can you believe the, the, you know, the abuse and fraud that they did? And everybody's like, oh, Eric thinks it's real. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> okay, it's awesome. So, in other words, his absurd interpretation of an article just magically transformed into a fact over the course of less than 24 hours in Jenks' head. Now, let me be very clear here. I don't think Eric Trump is really an important person and that what he thinks or what other people think about him is terribly important. His bit role in the story is pretty much irrelevant as far as I'm concerned. But I'm still struck by the fact that Jenk just made this stuff up, tried to claim that his speculation was cashed out by the reporting of another news organization, and convinced himself that it was true. Furthermore, the larger narratives that TYT pushes are just made of small stories like this. If Jenk is capable of convincing himself that his speculation is fact over the course of a day, think of what he's able to come up with over the course of two decades. And finally, to answer the question I was asked, because Jenk so easily twists information like this, as far as I'm concerned, he can't be believed to recount anything accurately, much less the circumstances of his departure from MSNBC. Jenk always believed that he was a threat to the corporate, political, and media establishments. So, of course he interpreted a private conversation about his performance with a media bigwig this way. I don't know a whole lot about Phil Griffin, but I do know that Jenk Uger just makes stuff up. Mm.